from the world these birds as possible in one calendar year. I did succeed on my quest. I saw 6,042 out of the 10,365 birds on planet Earth and got to the end of that year and thought, well, <laughs> now what? <laughs> what do you do after a big year like that? So I came back home and uh, recuperated and wrote a book about that whole adventure. And, and then I thought, well, for my next big adventure, I'd actually like to spend a coordinated amount of time just studying one bird and see how much I can learn. And so I went off to graduate school and I spent two years based out of Stony Brook University on Long Island, uh, just outside of New York City. And my project was on these guys, chinstrap penguins. And so here tonight, I just wanna tell you about some of my adventures, learning about the chinstraps down south in Antarctica. So let's see if this arrow goes forward. Oh, down. No, down. No, down, across, up, sideways. <laughs> oh, well, we'll try admire this chin strap a little while longer. <laughs> yeah. They are extremely cute birds, don't you think? They just, they don't even really look like birds. They look like, they look fake. They look animatronic almost. They look fluffy, but like a puppet at the same time. Oh, how tall are they? Chin straps are probably two and a half to three feet tall. So they come just above my knee or so. Uh, they're pretty strong. Okay, so tonight. We will have some history thrown in the mix. We'll talk about this gentleman a little bit. We'll throw in some cute baby penguin photos. We'll have a little bit of science here and there. Oh, there might be a celebrity cameo or two in this lecture as well. And uh, we'll talk about whatever it is exactly that's happening in this image at the end. But uh, first, to kick this thing off, I think we just want to set the scene here on this rock in the far Southern Ocean. This is called Elephant Island. And it is quite far away from here. So if you look at a world map, this is my main bone to pick with most world maps is that they just leave off an entire continent there at the southern edge of the world. So we'll put an X on that one and find one that actually shows Antarctica because Elephant Island is right there at the very tip of the Antarctic peninsula. And if you zoom in on that part of the world, just to get our bearings here, so we've got Chile and Argentina, we've got the Falkland Islands and South Georgia Island on the right, and then we've also got the Antarctic Peninsula down at the bottom. Cursor is on my screen. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> Elephant Island is uh, that little island right there at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. So if you want to get there, yes, exactly. You've got to make your way to this little town called Ushuaia, the southernmost city in the world at the far southern end of Argentina. And then from there, get on a ship and head south across this 550 mile passage of water that can be some of the rest, roughest ocean in the world called the Drake Passage between South America and Antarctica. And people get a little psyched out by the Drake Passage because of the weather that can roll through there. If you look up the Drake Passage on YouTube, as many people do before they come down to Antarctica for the first time, well, I'll show you what you find. So here is a nice little cruise ship. This one spends a lot of its summer season in places like the Mediterranean, and then every now and then ventures down to Antarctica across the Great Passage. And in 2010, here's that same ship in a wee bit of a storm. I believe this was actually after a wave had taken out the bridge windows and shorted out all of the communications equipment on board, and one of their engines was also inoperable. And this is being taken by another National Geographic ship that had sort of come to the rescue, and there's a very nice gentleman on board here who's got a satellite phone bundled up that they're going to try to throw across onto the deck of the other ship so that they can actually call out and tell about what their situation is on board. It all worked out fine. 
And they were able to motor their way unassisted all the way back to Ushuaia, but it took them about two more days of this before they made it back to port. So it must have been a bit of an exciting crossing for those guests on board that ship. <laughs> so this can happen once in a while. You get a hurricane in the Drake Passage, and we like to call that the Drake Shake. <laughs> but to be honest, more often, it looks like this on a nice day, and that is what we call the Drake Lake. There's albatrosses circling around the ship as you're sailing toward the south, and Cape petrels, and prions, and all kinds of crazy Southern Ocean seabirds that we don't get up here. And then, after about a day and a half of sailing from Ushuaia, you'll see some land up here on the horizon, and those are the peaks of Elephant Island just north of the Antarctic Peninsula. Here's the island from space. Okay, so it's 17 by 29 miles. But why do you think this island is called Elephant Island? It's nowhere near Africa. It does kind of look like an elephant if you add some body parts to it. But the first people that saw this island in around the 1820s were not looking at it by satellite. They were looking at it from beach level, and they're probably more concerned with the elephant seals that are clustered on the beaches all around the shorelines of the island. Although I kind of like a third explanation for the name, which is that it's simply an L of an island. <laughs> and this is a direct quote from this gentleman. Who Kathy mentioned earlier, Ernest Shackleton. He is probably the most famous Antarctic explorer, at least these days, even though his most famous expedition was pretty much a complete disaster. And I just want to lay it out for you because it's kind of an amazing story. Here's the setup Antarctica, you've got the South Pole in the middle and a couple of ocean seas taking bites out of either side. In 1909, Shackleton was part of one of the early expeditions trying to become the first one to reach the South Pole. And he got really close. He got within 97 miles of it, which is about where the tip of that green arrow is. And then decided to turn around, which probably saved their lives and um, come back another day. But then two years later, two other explorers, Scott and Amundsen, launched their own expeditions, and they both made it to the South Pole, although Scott famously didn't make it back. Amundsen did. So the South Pole had been reached, and so Shackleton thought, well, there goes my first trip to the South Pole. What can I do next? Well, no one has ever walked from one side of Antarctica all the way to the other side yet. So that's what he planned to do a couple of years later, and he was calling this the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. I love the names they came up with in those days. However, they never even took the first step on this journey because when their ship got to about where that red X is in the Weddell Sea, it ran into the ice and got stuck and completely surrounded. So the men were trying to hack the ship out of the ice, but it was just no use because there was so much ice around. They settled in over the course of the following winter to spend the whole winter on board, hoping they would drift out. However, a few months later, the ship got crushed by the pressure of the ice and sank, and the men were left there standing around on the ice with no ship anymore in the middle of nowhere. So at this point, it was just a desperate retreat for survival. And they managed to tow their lifeboats hundreds of miles across the ice, as well as follow its drift, until they reached the edge of the open ocean again, took to the water in their lifeboats, and made it to the shore of Elephant Island. Elephant Island. So this is why Elephant Island is such a famous place, because it paid a a very notable role in this saga of Shackleton's famous expedition. They did um, hunker down there for about four months on a shore. All of these men lived underneath that one tiny lifeboat turned upside down on the beach for several months, eating raw penguins and seal meat to try to survive, while Shackleton went off in the other lifeboat in the distance 
and sailed another few hundred miles east to reach South Georgia Island, where there was a whaling settlement, got some help, eventually came back and rescued every single one of his men, and all of them made it, which is a pretty incredible story. If you ever get the chance to read this book called Endurance, it tells the whole tale, which I have only really touched on lightly here. Or you can just watch the miniseries with Kenneth Branagh, <laughs> which is also quite entertaining. <laughs> but that ship, the Endurance, which is famous in these, in these photos that were saved from that expedition, you may have noticed in the news just within the past year, was rediscovered as a shipwreck underneath the ocean on the seafloor. And so we were able to see it in color for the first time ever this year which is pretty amazing. It's mostly intact on the seafloor now, resting upright and well-preserved because of the very cold bottom ocean water in that part of the world. And you can still read endurance across the stern of the ship even today. But now the only trace of Shackleton's expedition on Elephant Island today is this statue that does not commemorate Shackleton. It is actually a statue of the Chilean captain on the vessel that came to rescue his men at the end. This was installed by the Chilean Navy in a fit of nationalism in the 1980s. And there's nothing left of Shackleton or his crew today at that spot. But what else do you see in this photo? Yeah, there's a bunch of chinstrap penguins. There's actually even a couple of fur seals in this picture as well. Can you see them? There's one just below and to the left of the statue, that brown blob. And there's another one in the lower right hand corner, a couple of Antarctic fur seals. So Elephant Island is still deserted by humans. No one lives there except for a few researchers who pass by now and then. But it is full of metropolises, mostly of chinstrap penguins, which are the most abundant nesting animal on that desolate piece of land. Oh, and there's me with a couple of penguin researchers. How did I suddenly pop up in this photo in the middle of nowhere? Well, for the past 10 years or so, I've been working on expedition cruise ships taking tourists to Antarctica uh, for a couple of different companies, most recently one called Quark expeditions, Q-U-A-R-K. I just got back last week from two months in Greenland and a month in Svalbard this summer with Park and had a grand old time up north. So we take Zodiacs out and do whale watching and go see the penguins on shore and stuff like that. But on a couple of those tours, I met some penguin researchers. One thing led to another. An opportunity came up to do a master's degree studying chin straps. And I thought it would be a pretty cool way to follow up that big year that I did a couple of years before. So, meet the chinstrap penguin. They are so charismatic. Their chicks are so cute. They come back to this island just for a few months each summer to raise their chicks. If all goes well, they'll have two for each nest and they'll fledge both of them at the end of the summer. And then uh, at the end of the summer, after they've been fattening up on Antarctic krill all summer long and the chicks grow up, they get somewhat less cute as they grow larger. <laughs> they all swim out to sea in about March and then they can swim actually 4,000 kilometers away from their nesting area, spending the entire winter floating out in the middle of the Southern Ocean, hundreds of miles from any point of land for months at a time before they then turn around and swim all the way back to the breeding colony on Elephant Island the following summer and do it all again. And so the circle of penguin life continues. But no one really knew even how many chinstrap penguins there were out there because many of these colonies are in such remote places. So that was part of my project was to just try to count them all up and figure out how many there are and maybe put some data points together and get an idea of how they're doing these days with the changing conditions in Antarctica. And right before I started this program, this report came out called the 30 by 30 blueprint, which was put together by some scientists. It was an idea for how you could theoretically conserve 30% of the world's oceans by the year 2030. And you might notice across the bottom, it was put together by Oxford and University of York in the UK, but also this group called Greenpeace. 
Wait a minute. <laughs> Aren't Greenpeace the ones that do crazy stunts like hanging off of bridges to block shipping lanes and going up to cargo ships and painting funny slogans on the side of them and parachuting into professional soccer matches to protest big oil and that kind of thing? Well, yeah, that, that's definitely Greenpeace. They still do these types of campaigns all over the world. But as it turns out, it's a massive organization, and they also support a lot of really serious science along the way. And so when that 30 by 30 report came out, Greenpeace was all over it to try to raise awareness for it. They put together their own year-long voyage all the way from the Arctic to Antarctica, taking both of their ships from one end of the planet to the other along this route, stopping all along the way, taking scientists on board their ships, supporting their science, however they needed to be supported, and then using all that as a platform to raise awareness for the 30 by 30 campaign. You'll notice the last stop on the pole to pole expedition was Antarctica. So right after I started this master's program at Stony Brook, thinking I would just study some penguins, Greenpeace came to our lab and they said, we have a proposal for you. We need to spend about 40 days in Antarctica and we will give you access to our largest ship called the Esperanza, wherever you need to go, if uh, that sounds interesting to you. <laughs> and I was like, sign me up. We can go to some really remote penguin colonies. And thus was born our 2020 expedition to Elephant Island, which is very interesting from a chin straps perspective. So when this all went down, I started getting these emails in my inbox from Greenpeace about what to expect on board their ship, the Esperanza. And it was things you might expect, like all the food was going to be vegetarian food on board. It's not exactly like some of the cruise ships I've worked on in the past. So we were going to be in bunk beds and we'd be assigned daily chores. So I was literally like cleaning floors and cleaning out toilets while I was down there as well. And there might be some journalists and celebrities on board with us as well, just sort of depending on how it all came together. And when I read that last point, I just started laughing and I was like, oh my gosh, do you think that uh, Leo is going to be there? Ever since he made that Oscar speech about climate change, he's been like the climate change celebrity out there in the world. And no, Leonardo DiCaprio was not there with us in Antarctica. <laughs> but um, you can always dream. <laughs> Instead, we had this crew of hardcore, energetic, environmental activists that were just totally dedicated to supporting whatever we needed to do and wherever we needed to get to to find the chinstrap penguins, which was pretty cool because it meant we could make landings on some fairly rough surf type beaches that we wouldn't normally take tourist expeditions. That water is about zero degrees Celsius right at the freezing point. And um, it was pretty cool because we were able to get on land at each of these different penguin colonies and be able to survey them. What makes Elephant Island particularly interesting from a scientific penguin perspective is that it had been surveyed once before in all of history in the year 1970 by a British expedition. And that's where this map comes from. Each of those red dots marks a different penguin colony. There are 32 separate chinstrap penguin colonies around the shorelines of the island. They were all counted very carefully exactly 50 years before our expedition in 2020. So it gave us this historic baseline. You could at least compare against whatever we found today to see if they've gone up, gone down, stayed flat, or something entirely different. But how do you count all these penguins? <laughs> there are a lot of them, and the colonies tend to look something like this. Well, there are various methods you can use. The most basic one is you just find a big rock and climb up on top of it and start at one end of the colony and go one, two, three, four, five. You only have to count the nests. So you're not counting every single individual penguin, which makes it a little bit easier because nests don't move around. And 
once you get your eye in, this isn't too bad. As long as there's fewer than about 10,000 nests in a colony, you can, you can count them all with several friends of yours in the course of a day. Um, you have to count them all three times, so you're not within a too far of an error of your own counts. Um, but this is, has some advantages. This is how penguin counts have been done for decades now in different parts of Antarctica. You don't need a lot of field equipment, just a clicker in your hand and a field notebook to write all of your data down in the field. This is what the counts look like at the end of the day. And it means since you're using exactly the same methods, you can compare your counts today directly against what they got like back in 1970. But we did have some newer technology on this trip as well. We had a couple of guys from Northeastern University come along with us who are specialists in taking images by drone. So they put up this camera drone in the air, flew it over the penguin colonies, and took high resolution images. And here's what a penguin colony looks like from the air. Each of those pink blobs is a dense area of nesting chin strap penguins. The pink color comes from that krill that they eat and then poo out the back end. I am walking there in the very middle of the frame there, if you can make me out. So that gives you a sense of scale. So there's a few thousand penguins just in that image. But once you get a little bit closer with the drone, there's what the colony looks like. You can see the nests are equally spaced. This is when the chicks have already hatched. This is in about February. So all of the black and white blobs are adult penguins and all of the little fuzzy gray blobs alongside them are their chicks. And you start to kind of get your eye in about what constitutes a nest within pecking distance of their nearest neighbor. And then you can take photos from the drone and then put a dot on every single nest in the photo and get a pretty accurate count that way once you get back home. And the great advantage of that also is you have this documentation of exactly what it was like instead of just you saying, I saw 36,305 penguin nests, <laughs> the researchers of the future will be able to actually look at your evidence in your photographs and um, see if they agree. So I put dots on about 37,000 penguin nests like this after I got back at the end of the field season, which took uh, a few months to do. So the cutting edge of counting penguin nests now is where you take a drone photo like that and then train an AI algorithm to look at the image and count it on its own. So we fed an AI a whole bunch of like training images where we told it where all the penguin nests were and then let it loose. And this is what it came up with. All of those colorful boxes are put there automatically by the algorithm, which is saying its confidence level for each of those and what it thinks is a penguin nest. You can see it's doing pretty well. Almost all of those are 100%. Some of them are lower, some of them are not quite accurate, but on the whole, it's doing a very good job of picking out nests in this image. And that is much faster <laughs> than counting them manually. So to compare, for instance, here is an entire small island covered in nesting chinstrap penguins. Again, you can see the darker pink blobs. Those are where the penguins are nesting. You can just barely see them at this scale. How many penguins are there in this image? Well, I counted it by hand, and then we let the AI loose on it to see how well we would compare. I counted 6,223 chinstrap penguin nests on this island in several hours. And then the AI in about two seconds came up with 6,203. That's uh, remarkably close. And at this point, I'm not even sure which one of us was closer to the truth, to be honest. And so that's pretty encouraging. And I think this is probably the future of counting large seabird colonies of all kinds around the world, not just penguins. If you can put a drone up in the air, take a couple photos, take it back home and put it through your AI, it saves a lot of effort. However, my part in this field expedition was more of the ground counts. So I was spending long days in the field looking at penguins and staring at them for hours and hours every day. It gets to be kind of a 
zen activity after a while, just staring at penguins all day long. You can see whatever you want to see in the eyeball of a chinstrap penguin at the end of a 12-hour field day. But there were some other penguins to look at as well. Besides the chinstraps, Elephant Island also hosts a few nesting Gen 2 penguins. They have, um, like they're wearing a pair of white earmuffs on their head and a little bit of orange lipstick on their beach. Adelie penguins as well. We're at the very far northern edge of their range here. They're black and white. If you've seen um, Happy Feet, they're the ones that run around with Latino accents for whatever reason in that movie. But they are very charismatic in the field as well. We had a few macaroni penguins around as well. Super good looking rock star penguins with those crazy yellow plumes on the side of their head. And another sign perhaps of the times, King penguins have been colonizing Elephant Island just within the past 10 years or so. They're usually found farther north, but on a couple of the big sandy beaches, we found several king penguins now incubating eggs, which is uh, very interesting to see them expanding their range. A couple of the penguin colonies that we visited were big enough that we needed multiple days to be able to count every nest in the colony by hand. So we decided to set up shop on land and made our camp and slept on Elephant Island in these tents overnight. So I take it as a point of pride that besides Shackleton's crew, I am one of the few humans who have ever actually slept on the shores of Elephant Island, although in somewhat greater comfort than Shackleton was. One of the hazards of camping out on the beaches here are the elephant seals that I mentioned earlier. You can see one crawling up the beach there. This is at about two o'clock in the morning with the 24 hour daylight down there. Elephant seals are somewhat cuddly. It's called being thigmotactic, technically, scientifically, but they like to lie right next to each other on the beach to save body heat. And when one crawls up the beach, it's like looking for someone to cuddle with. And on this beach, that was our tent. So it's kind of hard to convince an elephant seal that you're not the greatest cuddle buddy and to turn it around and go find someone else to sleep next to you all night. Um, so this one took some encouragement before it finally reluctantly turned around and swam off to find another beach. But this is what can happen if you leave a pile of field equipment on the beach and come back a couple of hours later, there's going to be an elephant seal there just cuddling with it because it's programmed to do that. And after a molting Ellie has been on top of your backpacks for a couple of hours, they're never really going to smell quite the same forever afterward. One day, we stopped at a beach with some nesting penguins you can see in the background and elephant seals as well. And we found this thing washed up on shore. Do you have any idea what this is? It's, a, it's made out of rubber. It's hollow inside, so it's sort of like a giant tire or something. There are tires strapped onto the outside of it as well with chains. This is a a marine fender. So they hang it down between two ships when they're coming together at sea so that they don't scrape each other up as they're trying to unload something from one ship to another. You can also see them alongside piers and, and docks at harbors and that kind of thing. This one had evidently washed overboard from a giant container ship or something like that and then washed up just as a giant piece of trash on Elephant Island. So the Greenpeace activists kicked into gear and uh, we wrestled this thing for an hour or two until we finally managed to roll it down off the beach, towed it behind a Zodiac back to the ship. They used their crane to pick it up out of the water and then strapped it down to the back deck of the Esperanza and uh, rescued this giant piece of trash that had washed up on the shores of Elephant Island. We did end up having a couple of minor celebrities with us, as it turned out. This actor named Gustav, who was in the uh, TV show Vikings, I guess. He played this character, Floki. I've never watched that show before, so I had no idea who he was, but some people were very excited he was with us. He was super cool, super chill to hang out with, and um, his dad, incidentally, Stellan Skarsgård, is quite a famous Hollywood actor and has been in all kinds of movies, going back to the days of like the hunt for Red October and stuff like that. And he was in um, the series Chernobyl, which just came out recently. So 
quite a well-known family. And then we also had this French actress, Marion Cotillard, spent a couple weeks with us on board. She actually won the Oscar for Best Actress several years ago, and she has been in one or two movies starring alongside Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> so maybe he was there with us in spirit as well. <laughs> we were also supposed to have this Chinese actress with us named Mimi. Again, I never heard of her. Evidently, she's more famous in China than any of these other people combined in the rest of the world. But at the last minute, she couldn't come. And it was some like weird virus coming out of this region called Wuhan in China. Super strange. Like, what the heck? This celebrity Chinese actress can't join us in Antarctica? That was the first time I had ever heard of coronavirus. <laughs> was because we weren't gonna get to meet Mimi on board as it turned out. So at the end of this expedition, we crunched all the data, I'll save you the months of spreadsheets and just cut to the chase and show you the results, which were kind of interesting. So if you look at these two maps, this is obviously showing Elephant Island from above. Each of the dots is marking a penguin colony. The map on the left, the dots, the pink dots are the chin straps. There's the size of the dot is scaled for how many nests were found in that colony. The left one is showing 1970. The right one is showing our expedition in 2020. So what do you notice? A lot of those dots have shrunk quite a bit in the intervening 50 years, especially down there on the south shore of the island. Um, interesting to note. So overall, we found about 57% fewer nesting chin straps than there were there just a half century ago, which there may be various explanations for it, maybe not quite so dire as it sounds because of this interaction with the whale, commercial whale fishery and things like that earlier in the century, but definitely interesting to know. We had no idea we would find something like this. I thought maybe we'd find more than there were in 1970 for other theoretical reasons. So I wrote up my paper. This was the first scientific paper I'd ever published in my life. So I was very proud of it. And that's why I'm showing it to you on this slide. It came out in polar biology and went out there in the world. And I thought, all right, well, very good. But, um, you know, who really is going to care that much about how many penguin nests there are on some super remote island that no one ever even gets to go to in Antarctica. It's a very niche publication. Well, the New York Times picked it up and then it went out in National Geographic. And then from there, the story just kind of went around the world in all of the major media, some of them covering it a little more accurately than others, I thought, but um, it was interesting to see how many people did care about these penguins on Elephant Island when the story came out. And um, in my perspective, this all culminated when Leonardo DiCaprio posted a picture of me counting penguins on his official Instagram page with the caption, climate change is starving Antarctica's most iconic animal, which may be somewhat of a simplification, but great. I'm glad he's out there raising awareness for all this. And uh, it was pretty cool. It was what, 1.5 million views at that point. I thought that was great. <laughs> is it true though? Is it because of climate change that there's fewer penguins? Well, it's hard to ignore the correlation. I'm just gonna show you one climate change map. And this is it. This is not an interpretation. This is just raw data straight from NASA of the temperature anomaly since 1950 worldwide, just between the months of June and August. So this is a bit funky if you're comparing hemispheres because it's a different season in each hemisphere. So I just suggest look south of the equator. But what do you notice? There is one spot that is warmed up more than anywhere else in the Southern hemisphere. And that is right there on the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula, including Elephant Island. And we've seen associated reductions in the amount of sea ice year upon year and all the things that you might expect to happen. 
the temperature there has warmed up by something like five degrees Celsius. That's eight or nine degrees Fahrenheit just since the 1950s. So for whatever reasons, climate change is especially being focused in that particular area. And probably that is affecting the penguins that live there. I mean, it just seems like common sense. So then I wrote another paper that was a more global assessment of chinstrap penguins taking all of this kind of thing into account. And these assessments are useful, not just for raising general awareness out there, but also more practical on the ground things. In Antarctica, there are these marine protected areas that are being proposed. This is a map showing MPAs around the coastline of Antarctica. So the ones in light blue have already been enacted, including on the southern edge there, that's called the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. Several years ago, it was signed into law, and that is now the largest marine protected area anywhere in the world. What does that mean? It means there are certain limitations on fisheries and that kind of thing that can happen there. The dark blue areas are marine protected areas that are in different stages of proposal that haven't been agreed upon yet by all the members of the Antarctic Treaty that would have to agree to it in a consensus. And that includes Elephant Island there. So this kind of research and assessments of what we have out there and how the animals are doing these days can help when the policymakers are trying to come up with where to delineate these kinds of protected areas in the future. So I hope in my own small way, I've helped out the chinstrap penguins down there in the far south and that we'll have them for many more years to come in the future. And meanwhile, after I got off the ship and went back to crunch all my data, these Greenpeace folks who had been perfectly well behaved the whole time we were there with them in Antarctica, started sending out these photos of that marine fender that we found washed up on the beach. Well, they painted some stuff on the side of it, and then they went out and they found a transshipping vessel in the Southern Ocean and they towed this fender right up to the side of it for a nice little photo op. So transshipping is its own big subject in Antarctica. It's where they offload fish from one big ship to another and it's basically a way of laundering fisheries from different parts of the world and um, obscuring where they come from. So, so they got right up there next to the ship and then they boarded the ship and got right up in the face of the captain and crew on board and had a nice little discussion evidently with them. So I found that somewhat amusing. They also projected this nice little slogan on the side of an iceberg at the end. And that was the close of the pool to pool expedition from Greenpeace's end. The chin straps are still down there right now. It is what, September, so they're out at sea right now, swimming around in mostly darkness in the Southern Ocean. Summertime is approaching in Antarctica. In another month or so, the chinstraps will start to return to the shores of Elephant Island. They will try to find the mates that they had last year. If all goes well, they'll mate with them again in the same spot and raise a couple more chicks. And again, the circle of penguin life will continue. But I wanted to show you a couple of last little video clips from Antarctica because in the past couple of years on our tourist trips, we've had a couple of encounters in our zodiacs with penguins trying to escape from predators in the water. This one is called a leopard seal. Leopard seals will eat penguins and other seals and things like that from the ocean. And you can also see orcas in that part of the world. And we had a group of orcas chasing a penguin, which you could see jumping, leaping out of the water, trying to evade the orcas there while we were out in our zodiacs. <laughs> and the penguin jumped in with us. <laughs> so now what? You've got a penguin in your boat and the orcas are still circling the zodiac waiting for the penguin to jump back out again somewhere, what do you do? <laughs> well, here's another example. This was from just last season, and a deli penguin leaped into my zodiac, trying to escape from a leopard seal in the water. And I noticed there was an iceberg nearby, and I thought, well, I've never tried this before, but 
maybe we can just slowly ease over to the iceberg and then the penguin won't have to go back in the water and go for a swim and we won't have to kidnap it back on board our ship either to keep it safe. So I didn't know how this was going to go. We got closer and closer to the iceberg and the penguin, which had just been posing for us, seemed to get the idea <laughs> and it judged the distance. And what do you know, it jumped right off onto the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that the leopard seal went hungry, but I'm sure it found another penguin shortly thereafter. So at least if you can't save all the penguins in the world, you can save them one at a time from your zodiac. So uh, with that, thank you very much. <laughs>
while one is on the nest, the other one will be out at sea gathering food for themselves, and then they switch off at intervals of one to two days or so. And then once the eggs hatch, they start switching off at even shorter intervals. One will go out and gather some krill and then come back and very tenderly barf it up down the chick's gullet. And then the other one will go out and they switch off like that for another month or so until one day when the chicks are not even full grown yet and they're still fuzzy on shore at the end of summer, about mid-February, the parents say, enough is enough. I've fed you more than you can take. And so they just leave at that point and they abandon the chicks on shore at the end of the summer. And then you have this period of a couple of weeks where the young penguins all huddle together in groups on shore called creches. And then at the very end of summer in March, they quickly lose those downy feathers and they swim out to sea all on their own without the guidance of their parents even because it's just like hardwired into their brain somehow and they know even these chimp straps where to migrate thousands of miles away for that first winter at sea before they come back and try to find a mate and uh, make their own nest when they're about three or four years old for the first time. Yeah. Do you know what the lifespan, the average lifespan? Yeah, what's the lifespan of a chimp strap? Probably around 20 years or so, which is a long time for a bird of that size. But it's consistent with other seabirds in the world in general, tend to be fairly long lived and then they don't reproduce that much. So a lot of seabirds in the world will lay one egg. These penguins lay two eggs per year. However, most of them don't survive their, till their first breeding. So maybe 90% of those penguin chicks don't come back for the first time. That's the crux. If they can survive those first couple of years and figure it out on their own in the wild, then they have very high survival from one year to the next as adults thereafter. And again, they don't really have much in the way of predators except occasional orcas and leopard seals in the water. They have no predators on land as adults, which is why they don't see us as a threat when we're walking around the penguin colony. There are these rules that you're not supposed to get closer than five meters to a penguin on, on trips to see them, but the penguins don't know those rules. So you stand there and they walk up to you and they untie your shoelaces and walk around you and go to sleep next to your boots and try to crawl into your lap. And they're very, very endearing that way. <laughs> sure, and back. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah that's good. Good question. Is this full circle? Absolutely. The first time I ever went to Antarctica was in 2008. I had just graduated from Oregon State as an undergrad. I was 22 years old. My first job was as an intern field tech on a penguin research project outside of McMurdo Station. So I went through the U.S. Antarctic program, flew through Christchurch, New Zealand, got a, on a U.S. Air Force cargo jet down to the ice runway outside of McMurdo. From there, got on a helicopter with two other researchers who flew us out to the middle of freaking nowhere at a place called Cape Crozier and dumped us off on the ice with about 300,000 nesting Adelie penguins in a small colony of emperor penguins. And we spent the next three months, just the three of us, all summer in our field camp, putting satellite tags on penguins and counting them and, and doing various projects with them. But that was my first experience in Antarctica. And after that summer, I was just so taken with it. I was like, I gotta find a way to get back down here. And that's how I got hooked up with those tourist trips on ships going from South America. And so, yeah, it was pretty cool to go back to Antarctica again as a researcher, but this time in charge of my own research projects and um, getting some credit for it in the form of a degree. There's a couple questions here from the digital audience. Let's see, did you bring all the provisions to begin with that you would need for your entire stay and how did you prepare your food? 
Well, this time, fortunately, we had a whole ship <laughs> and a chef <laughs> who was from India, which was a total jackpot. And so we were fed very well on this particular expedition. <laughs> that first trip that I went to Antarctica on living in a field camp was much the opposite. We were cooking for ourselves and we had three months worth of frozen food out back, nothing fresh. And so we were cooking a lot of frozen meat and veggies on that trip. Although we found a way to cook, um, well, make, I guess, fresh yogurt. There's this system called Easy Yo that I've never heard of before that's very popular in New Zealand, apparently, that you get this powdered mix, you put it in a plastic container, and then you fill the outside of the plastic container, it has a hollow for boiling water, and then you just leave that for about six hours or overnight, and the next morning, you wake up and you have perfectly prepared fresh yogurt. So even in the middle of nowhere in Antarctica, you can get fresh yogurt, which is pretty cool. I don't want to keep you all night. You're welcome to come uh, chat afterward. And I think we have a couple other discussion points oh, as well. Chat question? No, no, I think we've just got some other comments here. Oh. <laughs> and I uh, appreciate everyone watching online as well. Here in the room, I do have some books in the back. If you would like one, just come see me after class back there. <laughs> and I'd be happy to sign one for you. And uh, in the meantime, thank you so much again for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again, Noah. Yes, he does have some books in the back. Um, and then I also wanted to say that we'll probably have about a 10 minute break and, of course, look at the books. And then we will reconvene for anyone wanting to stay and share their sightings or any, ask any questions about birding that you might have. So, about 10 minutes and then we'll reconvene. Thank you. Thank you.